morning. Thank you for coming out on what started as a rainy Sunday, and maybe the sun will be out. We have the PA system on. We don't really need it in the side room, but it's enabling us to feed. We are live streaming this event on HowlRound.com slash TV. Thank you to HowlRound for having us. Very bassy, isn't it? Well, I, uh, and let's get on with it. I welcome to the seat of the Assembly Group, Dr. Jackson Dwyer, who's going to be conducting this conversation with our honorary Southern Marguerite. Never says goodbye, she only hangs up the phone. 
And that was a crucial piece of information. That she hung up on me. I knew not to take it personally. But you know, just I'm, I'm only giving you that anecdote as an example of the kinds of experiences that a senior writer gives a junior, not even junior, but fledgling writer, that mean the world. It, it makes you feel like you're part of a tradition, part of a, a, an ongoing conversation. Yeah, and I've read, uh, as you know, I've read some of the letters Donald has given his papers to Yale. I didn't give him his papers. I wasn't going to make you sound mercenary. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I read some of the letters that Bob wrote to you in the early years of yeah. your career. He went to see your plays and frequently would write you a letter about the play. Yeah, well, but a constructive critique. And, and, and he was basically an appreciator of them. Uh, he, he was. You know, I, I, early on, and, and, and Jeffrey Sweet and Michael Ryder here at the birth of the play, I'm about to tell you that it's called Resting Place. Which uh, it was just a, you know, it was, it was a, an exercise. I wrote these two related one act plays, one of which was written in three verse and was spoken by a homeless man. And um, it wasn't terribly honest, but it was uh, funny. Was and Bob uh, uh, read it or saw it, I don't remember. And, and I remember he sent me, uh, he sent me a, a letter. And he always typed letters. What uh, with the advent of computers, you typed letters. And, um, and he wrote, and his response to Rest of was, really wild man, <laughs> which was a very far kind of thing to say. A man who wore ties to all occasions. And um, he didn't get it, but he also, you know, he didn't denigrate it. He just kind of scratched his head a little bit. And then I think uh, when I had a success in New York with collected stories, he wrote me this rapturous, uh, this was 20 years ago, a rapturous letter um, about how, thank God, you've finally written a well-made book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would probably be a good point here to ask you how you passed it on. In other words, how you now, as a somewhat senior playwright, see your role as the Bob Anderson to other players. It's well, you know, as I said, I was very, very privileged to, to have. Uh, Wonderful men. They were they were elder men uh, who fostered me as a as a young artist. Um, Julius Milke was one of these. Uh, Jay Elbert was the only teacher of dramatic literature at Curtis. There was no course in playwriting. And when I had this itch to write plays, which is still kind of mysterious to me, it was uh, Jay's office door that I knocked on uh, to ask if he would sponsor me in a playwriting tutorial. And Jay, <coughs> uh, Jay uh, accepted the, the proposal with laughter. And we met every week, and I wrote ferociously for that semester. I, I was quite productive. And at the end of the semester, there was a, uh, an evaluation form that had to be filled out. And there was a portion of this form that was, do you recommend that this student continue in this field? And Jay wrote, in capital letters, yes, with about six exclamation points. And that was an incredibly seminal moment for me, to get that kind of enthusiastic validation. And that is something that I, I share with my students. I learned that there is no point in even withholding with young people, or even uh, with even skeptical of, of what, where they might go. But if you suspect that there is talent there, by all means, share that, that suspicion with them. It, it is so meaningful. So that, you know, because I had people like Jay and AJ, my art, my art school mentor, uh, who embraced young talent, it really it provided me with, a, with such an invaluable role model as a teacher. I've been teaching for 25 years ago. Some of those years were part of what was spent teaching at the drama school, just a few of them. But primarily, I've been teaching uh, undergraduate and English and theater studies. So how, uh, aside from the mentor aspects of teaching, has teaching helped you as a player? I think that, yeah, I think it's, it continues to stimulate me. Um, I, I, on my syllabus uh, are plays that I love to talk about. And when I teach these plays each year, I reread them each year. And I, uh, I, I 
that to vicariously experience what he just exposed us to in Christ, which is the next best thing to experiencing something for the first time. You can't ever really uh, replicate that, but through teaching you can begin to touch on what it was that excited me in the first place. So I teach. Uh, I, I, I teach mostly contemporary American and English plays, and I end the term with our town. Uh, and, uh, and it's always very thrilling for me to reintroduce these students to these plays that they may have been exposed to uh, as younger students, but may not have appreciated uh, to the extent to which I hope I can illuminate. Uh, I read in an interview that you once gave uh, that somebody asked you what one of the highlights of your career were, and you said one of the career highlights was writing the introduction to our town. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, Donald I, and I share a wilder interest, I have to admit. Uh, and could you talk a little bit about why it's a career highlight and what you value so much in that play? Well, I, you know, um, my wife and I saw the Greg Mosher production, I think it was in, uh, you probably know that, in 88? Baldy Gray. Baldy Gray is a stage manager. Mm -hmm. Bill Mason mm -hmm. was the uh, Cali. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was stunning. It was an absolutely stunning I think that's available on some sort it of is. video. It is. It's with now. Eric Stoltz and uh, Penelope and Neil Avery, I believe. I believe that's the one. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I, I had been exposed to Alicorn as, as a high schooler, and I had seen student productions, but then I had always seen very hokey and very uh, uh, sort of uh, sentimental Norman Rockwell Americana. And uh, when Lynn and I saw that Brad Mosher production, we were devastated. And I went home and I looked at my copy of Alicorn, which of course I had. Well, I wanted to see what Brad had done to her. What did he cut? What did he change? Nothing. I changed. That was the lesson. And uh, you know, to be exposed to something, to a work of art like Alicat, which is truly fine art, uh, when you're too young to appreciate its greatness, there is there's a gift to be had in that. Because you can rediscover a great work of art many times during your life, when you are at different points in your own journey, and you have different points of reference to, to relate the work of art. So um, I, I guess my uh, affection for Wilder was known uh, uh, to Tappan Wilder, the nephew of, of uh, Thornton. And Tappan Wilder, uh, who has become a friend, who I'm a delightful man, um, invited me to be part of the <coughs> symposium at Yale. You must have been there. Yeah. yeah. John Blair. John Blair and uh, Pete Turney and I, and uh, I was thrilled to be a part of that discussion. And then shortly thereafter, the, the Wilder plays were going to be reprinted by um, Harper, Harper Collins. All of the work, the entire canon of Wilder, all of his, his lesser known novels and all of the plays were being reissued. And he wanted part of Kathy's pitch to Harper Collins was that each of these volumes would be introduced by a different contemporary writer. And Kathy called me one day and he said, uh, how do you like to write the introduction to the skin of our teeth? And I said, I don't know if you read the skin of our teeth, Kathy. I, 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 it's not one of my favorites. And I reread it, and I thought, I shouldn't write this introduction. Paula Vogel should write this introduction. It's much more something that she would have been influenced by than I. So he said, oh, what a great idea. And I said, well, I guess I've just talked myself out of a job. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, you know, I, I was going to ask you if you wanted to do Alitan. I said, yes, I would love yeah. to do Alitan. And that, you know, just to, to, to be anointed in this way by Kathy was such a thrill. And of course, I, I, I clutched, I paralyzed. How the hell am I going to do this? I am not worthy. Uh, but I did find a way into it, and I'm, I'm very proud of that introduction. And uh, I receive emails from strangers all the time who comment on it. Uh, but that was really uh, such a validating moment for me to, to, to even have my name uh, in the same breath with Wilder was an extraordinary experience. Um, to go back to the beginning, um, do you think there's some relationship, uh, I don't know whether you <coughs> remember this, but Langford Wilson started as a visual artist. Definitely. Uh, and uh, 
number of writers have started. Well, with, uh, yeah, and I wonder whether you see any relationship between your origins as a visual artist and uh, now as a writer. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I always thought visually. Uh, I, you know, I like looking at pictorial diagrams rather than written instructions to things. So that's the way my brain is wired. Uh, when I'm imagining a play, sometimes it's just picturing a person sitting and a person standing. I, but I think that's something all writers do. You, you visualize what the configuration of, of, of people on stage might be. I do know that the approach that I take to writing is very similar to the approach that I took to drawing. And that is, and that was my main pursuit as an art student, drawing and graphic design. But I drew every day, hours a day. It was, it was a really wonderful time in my life. But the, my approach to drawing was that I like to get sort of the big picture down, just sort of a big mess, and then erase and erase and refine and refine. And that's very much the approach that I take to play with. I, I start out with very messy, very full first drafts. And then I pull back and pull back. So it's almost a sculptural kind of thing. Yeah, I know Lanford uh, said at one point that he, uh, when he first began writing plays, he had a great interest in the poster. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the poster. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was going to ask because yeah. you have that visual sense. Yeah. Um, you you have said uh, once that some of the plays come from a feeling of disgust. Where where do not disgust this uh, disquiet? I'm sorry. Well, Bob used to say, Bob Anderson used to say, and I don't think it was original with him. I think he was quoting somebody else. He said, "Write about what bugs you." Yes. And that's very similar to this. But where, where do the plays come from? Is it always a feeling of disquiet? Do you hear, a, do you think of a character? I'm sure it's different with different plays, but could you talk about some of the sure. plays and where they've come from? Well, they, they come from all different places, that's the thing. You know, when I'm talking to, to young writers and my students, and they say, how, you know, how do you get ideas? Well, the ideas sort of present themselves. And they present themselves in the form of something you can't stop thinking about, which is not the same as having an idea. <laughs> and uh, you know, with with Jim and with friends, for instance, uh, uh, Lynn and I have been together for 35 years. And at the time that I was writing the play, uh, we were in our 40s, and uh, we were suddenly experiencing the phenomenon of couples like us who were suddenly imploding all around us. And we were just sort of clutching one another in the, in the firestorm. And uh, you know, just just enduring and, and being kind of mystified and uh, gobsmacked by what was happening around us, I decided there was a play there. You know, so many couples that we associated with, that they were part of our social lives, that we somehow thought we'd be there forever in the same role, they were suddenly gone. And that's where it's gonna be came from. Uh, something like, um, uh, Something like collected stories came out of a couple of uh, things that converged. Uh, Debbie and I met yesterday, but I think I'm about to tell a story that I, I was going to tell you in private, earlier, which is that uh, two incidents occurred that, that contributed to collected stories, which is about an older woman writer and a younger woman writer. Um, and I, I knew it was going to be a two-hander, I knew that it was going to be a kind of generational study about influence and uh, surrogates parenting and all of that. Um, and I was, became very fascinated by a controversy that was, that was raging in the literary world that involved uh, the short story writer David Levitt and Stephen Spender, the poet laureate of, of England. Uh, David uh, Levitt is a, 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 a little younger than I am, maybe he's in his, his 50s now. Um, David uh, is an uh, outwardly homosexual writer who decided that he was going, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, he decided that he was going to take a chapter from Stephen Spender's autobiography, which was uh, a veiled uh, uh, rendering of a love affair that Spender had during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, but because of the constraints in, of the mores of the time, it was not a very candid portrayal, according to David Love. Uh, so what he did was he wrote a novel called, uh, I think it's called Why, Wild England Slide. Isn't it? I confuse it with the Robert Kennedy 
was called uh, uh, John Kennedy. Wine. 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 This but is wild. Yeah. Um, Which is already pretty for somebody yeah, else. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, and in that novel, um, uh, Levitt was very explicit in his sexual relationship with students. And Spender, who was still alive, took terrible objection to this and uh, took, uh, took uh, Levitt to court in England, succeeded in getting uh, portions of the, of the novel excavated in England. It, it, the, same, the same laws did not apply here. Anyway, I was really fascinated by so many aspects of this story. And around the same time, I experienced my own kind of skirmish with uh, a, a writer I admired, Arthur Miller. Uh, I wrote a play called The Mom and Family Picnic. And Mr. Miller took exception to my writing a play called, called The Lotus Mom and Family Picnic. And he was um, uh, very rejecting of it, let's say. Uh, uh, I, and he, I, I believe he'd never read it. But his agent began to make very uh, bellicose noises. And uh, he, in fact, uh, told Lynn Meadow at Manhattan Theater Club, this would have been around 1989, yeah, uh, that uh, he, he can't believe that you produced this play. And uh, Lynn called me, I remember this quite vividly. She called me and said, Oh, why don't you just change the title of the play? I said, I'm not changing the title of the play. The, the title of the Roman family, the Romans are not characters in it. The play is about the influence of Miller's play on me and my alter ego, Mitchell, an 11 year old boy who uh, is exposed to death himself for the first time, as I was at that age. Uh, in, in my case, it was the uh, the television production of E.J. Todd Milton Dunn and George Siegel and James Valentino, which had a profound effect on my little psyche. <laughs> because I was a bright little Brooklyn boy, I recognized my family. And, uh, and it was terrible. It was, I felt very guilty about it. And uh, my way of, of assimilating that was to write a, uh, a musical comedy parody of Death the Salesman called Willie with an exclamation point. <laughs> I really did that. <laughs> then years later, years and years later, uh, when my father died and I was telling my wife's story with my, my childhood, she said, you never told me that before. And I realized that I had more family stories to mind, and it involved in a, a, a certain chapter in my childhood, growing up in Coney Island, in a housing project in Coney Island. My father was a salesman. And one of two sons, do the math. <laughs> and there was, and I began to write a play that, that took place in 1965 when I was 11 years old. And uh, Death of a Salesman was a present in that apartment. I just could not shake it. So in my attempt to write about it, how could I not have acknowledged the influence of Miller? I had to. Otherwise it would have been disingenuous, it would have been unfinished. So I decided I was going to use my autobiography in that I would have 11-year-old Mitchell write a musical comedy version of Death is Open called Willie, except we would get to see it. So what comes out in Death of in, in the, in the Roman Family Picnic is, is after a horrifying encounter between the father, the beleaguered salesman father and his older son who has just been bar mitzvah. The older, uh, the father has to negotiate a way to get the bar mitzvah money that the boy scored that day in order to pay for the bar mitzvah. <laughs> Something the older boy didn't know was part of the deal. And it's a, it's a harrowing scene. And it becomes a really cataclysmic moment in the life of my little family on the stage. And the only place to go after that was into song. <laughs> so there's a 10 minute musical that I wrote with David Shire, I did the lyrics, he did the music, uh, of, of, of this little capsule of Willie that burst out of this, <coughs> burst out of this <coughs> climactic scene in the second half. Anyway, Miller was appalled by this I, the very idea. I, I don't even know how much of you knew. But um, the play then was killed by Mel Gussell and Miller, who uh, uh, really dismissed it. Uh, other reviews were kind of extraordinary, but we know the New York Times is all that matters. Cut to a couple of years after that, uh, Lynn Meadow produced uh, an out of 
looking for this to become an agendizer. I'm still answering your question. Uh, you know, <laughs> produce um, cycling food, a place that began to stop their circumcision. And in Frank Ritchie's review of Sight on the Scene, he referred to Mr. Margulies' last daring play, The Lonely Family Picnic. Now, mind you, Rich was not the New York Times critic who panned it. He didn't review it. But in his review of Sight and Scene, which was a rage and which was transforming, it, it was the breakthrough that I hoped that The Lonely Family Picnic would have been you know, three years earlier. With the use of the word daring, there was this sudden vision about the play. And when Meadows said to me uh, the morning after this triumphant opening sign and scene, you know, Bob, we should think about doing Lonely again. <laughs> I said, great. <laughs> so it was done in 1993. Lynn herself directed it beautifully uh, on a Sandra Lopato set with Christine Baranski and Peter Friedman uh, uh, on the main stage of the Manhattan Theater Club's uh, city center. It was an exquisite production. When it was announced that it was going to be produced, Lynn received a letter from Arthur Miller mm -hmm. that said, uh, when you produce, and now this is, this is a pretty damn good paraphrase, because I may have read this multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said, when you produce this the first time, and this is what he said that was so shocking. When you produce the, this place the first time, I, um, I thought it would simply go away. <laughs> that you are producing it again, I find it unconscionable. That's pretty harsh. Pretty harsh coming from a man I admire, whose work I admire, whose work meant so much to me. Uh, but it, it was quite a stunning blow. So I'm telling you that very personal uh, story, if you know what say, uh, <laughs> as an illustration of the kind of disquiet that produces a play. Because what happened was, with the convergence of my own experience, with influence, and David Levitt's experience with influence. I mean, David, and I don't know David Levitt. I feel that I do, because we share certain traits, I believe, and, and our approaches to influence. Um, between those two things, I got a play out of it, and uh, a play I never thought of. But I couldn't have written it, I think, if I hadn't been dealt that blow by uh, uh, someone I admired. Well, I think now is the time to tell you that Karen has just gotten a call from Anton Chekhov. <laughs> <laughs> it's on your case. Take the test. <laughs> um, um, I was going to ask you, apropos of collected stories and also apropos of Coney Island Christmas, what's the Grace Paley thing that you seem to have going? Because a lot of people have seen in collected stories mm -hmm. that that older writer in many, I mean, this is unfair, but they have suggested right. that, that uh, she had bears a certain resemblance to Grace, who mm -hmm. I knew. I don't know what you mean. I, I never was. Uh, is there a, is there an interest there? That, uh, oh, sure. I, I, yeah, I, I, I uh, discovered Grace Paley in high school, and uh, I love Grace Paley's story. And, uh, what was notable about Grace, and I call her Grace because it was the one conversation I had there when she told me about Grace. Uh, she, um, she only wrote short stories. She never wrote a novel. She never took that step. And I found that a really fascinating thing. And she was utterly at peace with the world at the time. She was not plagued by it. And I, I thought that was a really interesting uh, trait in a character I was creating. So that if, if I borrowed from Grace, it was, she was a teacher, she was of a certain generation, she was Jewish, uh, and she only wrote short stories. Aside from that, I didn't know Grace at the time, I only sort of you know, knew the CV that I'm describing to you. So that when I was creating the role of Ruth Steiner, I, uh, I thought it would be really interesting if she were solely a short story writer, but produced in Lisa Morrison a buddy novel. And that what would that do in the dynamic of a mentor who, who carved out a niche for herself in a very specific genre, who then produces someone who is aspiring to that which she has never really allowed her to. That's, that was the great period of Lisa Isn't she a, uh, I, I don't know Coney Island Christmas, but isn't she also, 
inspired by it's Grace based Perry. On, based on a Grace Perry short story called The Loudest Voice. And Coney on Christmas came out of uh, a discussion I have with my late dear friend, Bill Cates, who ran the second class. It's also Bob Anderson. Yes, and, and directed uh, I Never Sang for Um And Bill, uh, Bill called me one day and said, how do you like to write as a Christmas show? I said, Bob, why me? <laughs> it's nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn to write a Christmas show. He said, uh, I said, if I'm going to write you a Christmas show, it's going to be a Jewish Christmas show. <laughs> and he said, great. <laughs> and then I had to figure out, what am I going to do? Uh, I accepted this commission to write a Jewish Christmas show. And uh, I got an idea. I remembered, it was one of those thunderbolt moments, I remembered a short story by Grace Perry, The Loudest Voice, which is set in Depression era Brooklyn, or Bronx, I mean Brooklyn. Uh, and um, in it, Shirley Abramowitz, who is a first generation uh, American Jew, uh, is chosen by her drama teacher to be the voice of Jesus in the school play because she has the loudest voice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very slender story, but I thought, what a delicious premise for a Christmas show. So until you know, you know, Bill, you know, gave me. I accepted this commission from my friend because I thought, okay. Uh, and and the other directive I got from Bill was, you know, if you want to put an ice skating rink in it, put an ice skating. I want it. I want this to be big. Of course, it's got one production in life. Uh, but anyway, when I discovered, when I rediscovered the loudest voice, and, and I, it's one of it was one of those adaptation experiences that I have every now and then. I pick up some material. I know how to do this. And I decided that the play would be made up of um, uh, adults playing children doing a Christmas play, which uh, turned out to be a very delicious thing for actors, as you can imagine. And, um, but it became a larger play about assimilation and about and, uh, uh, the immigrant culture, the American dream, all of that. But it was because I remembered that story of Grace's that I that had such an impression. She's a very favorite of mine, and that's why I wanted to bring her into the conversation. She's not exactly. Uh, oh, also, may I just interject? There's a one online you can find uh, uh, Grace reading the loudest voice. Oh, and Grace Perry, Grace Perry, who I knew pretty well, is the epitome of a writer who you should hear reading her work because her voice in her stories is Grace's voice. Oh, it's it's joyful. I mean, yeah. she, you know, some writers have great difficulty reading yeah. their own work. Grace was wonderful. Oh, and Linda Lavin does does a selected shorts of it also, which is also worth it. I want to quote something to you that I heard you, you say once, and it so approximates something I believe about theater that I wanted to hear you respond to. It. I've always been interested in behavior and subtext, in things that are not said that are expressed through behavior. Mm -hmm. No, there's nothing to say. <laughs> what, I, what, what, I, what catches me about that is so many times you see theatrical moments that are not theatrical. Mm -hmm. That are, you know, you could make them a novel. You right. could make them a lot of things. Right. And so many times playwrights, theater people forget that it yeah. is what you see. It is theater, not I mean, I'm an English professor, but right. it's not just about language, it's about behavior. And it's also, watching uh, The Country House the other night, it was wonderful to see so many moments where what wasn't said or what was said didn't by any means cover the whole subject. Mm -hmm. Is that a conscious thing that you do, or do you think it's just woven into your way of writing? I think it probably is my way of writing. It, it's um, uh, you know something I, I try to, to, to instill in my students is the importance of conflict. You know, so this is something that we often overlook. Uh, that you need conflict. You need there to be opposing objectives. And the thing about uh, uh, drama is that people don't always say, except maybe in some Woody Allen movies where there's no subtext. Like but but people you know often say. Uh, Indirectly, they go through different strategies to achieve what they want. It's not what's spoken directly, it's what is 
is subversive, what is subterranean, that is, uh, uh, is really the story behind the words. Uh, and I find that, I mean, as a theater goer, as a, as a reader, as a writer, I find that much more interesting. Yeah, and I, I often think that writers don't give the audience enough credit. Yeah. You know, that you don't have to spell things out. I mean, we all do in our daily lives exactly what you're describing, and right. we all recognize it. And why aren't we given the opportunity to recognize that on stage? Right. Uh, we can do it. Uh, talk a little bit about, um, I mean, the uh, Coney Island Christmas story makes you wonder whether there's a different process when somebody assigns you something mm -hmm. as opposed to something that you come up with on your own. Not that, right. uh, the Gil Cates example is one example, but you've also done a number of adaptations, you've done some screenplays. How are those processes all different? You know, I, I enjoy adaptations. Uh, it, it, it's almost a respite from my own tortured psyche. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm able to uh, use my skills as a dramatist, in a, in a different <coughs> type of problem solving way that is not the same as, you know, sort of dredging up from the marrow. It's not the same. It doesn't mean I don't care about it as much. It's not true at all. But it, it's, it's, I have easier access to my skills as a dramatist than I do as a playwright, if that makes any sense. And uh, it's, it's enjoyable. Uh, you know, I have accepted commissions over the years that were specific commissions. I've also accepted commissions that were, we want your next play. Uh, you know, with the specific commissions, uh, because South Coast Repertory commissioned me to write a play for their Theater for Young Audiences series, I was moved to write Shipwrecks and Entertainment, which uh, turned into a very sophisticated play for children, so much so that they put it in the season on the main stage. Yeah, I've seen it as an adult play. Well, exactly, that's the thing, but it's, it's a play for all ages, is the point. But I would not have written had I not received the commission to write a play for young audiences. It, it just was, it's the way the play evolved. Um, uh, years and years ago, uh, Arvind Brown at Longwood uh, uh, asked me to write a, uh, an adaptation for Longwood. And I decided to adapt a, a play by Shalom Ash, a Yiddish classic by Shalom Ash called God of Vengeance, uh, which was. Uh, from 1906. And uh, I had read that years and years ago uh, through my friend Susan Morrison, who had asked me to help her with a play about a Jewish prostitute at the turn of the century. And in my research for Susan many, many years ago, I came upon a play called God of Vengeance, which is about a Jewish brothel keeper who, in, in his basement, uh, has a brothel. And upstairs is his pure 17 year old daughter. But what he doesn't know is that his 17-year-old daughter is having a love affair with one of the girls in his stable. A shocking play in 1906. A shocking play in the end. Because it was eminent of 1906 Zionist Prussia culture. Anyway, so Arvin commissioned a play for me, and I decided I wanted to try my hand with God of Vengeance. I never would have written that if it had any commission. Uh, you know, my take on it was very different. I said it in America in 1923, and it's a very different kind of play. Uh, but my point is that I would not have written the entire Talk a little bit, we talked just briefly last night about the Ulysses idea that you have now. That's a good example of exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Talk a little this bit about This is so, it. not even half baked. Well, but yeah. it's an interesting <laughs> answer. <laughs> so that's not that it never happens. Yeah. How, you, how you went from what it is to what you right. could do with it. Right. Uh, now this is, this you don't mind talking about it. Well, it's only been streamed live. Uh, <laughs> I think it's in the Vatican. <laughs> there it's safe. <laughs> uh, uh, but just to give you an example, uh, you know, can I tell you about a different thing oh, that sure. I actually <laughs> achieved? <all> the David Foster Wallace. Okay, that's okay, a better example. <laughs> that's Alice. Okay. Yes. The Vatican already knows about no, that. that. We, well, the other project that Jackson was working on, we discussed last night because I know his interest in, in the little review, which figures in a, a, a story that I was at about the uh, obscenity trial surrounding the UC. That's, that's only a list. Mm -hmm. uh, that someone sent me for possible adaptation. Um, but uh, 
I, I just read the movie uh, that's coming out July 31st in New York and Los Angeles. Keep playing. Uh, it's called The End of the Tour. And the origin of that is that um, my manager, my longtime manager, David Cantor, sent me uh, a book that had come his way called Although, of course, you end up becoming yourself, a road trip with David Foster Wallace by a writer named David Lipsky. And uh, 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 Cantor sent this to me with a note. Because I should explain that this book, Although, of course, you end up becoming yourself, is a transcription that uh, David Lipsky has put together in book form of a five-day conversation he had with Wallace in 1996 when he was sent by Rolling Stone to interview Wallace just as Infinite Jest, which his main focus, uh, hit the scene in 1996. And, um, and Cantor sent me this, this book and said, take a look at it, there might be a play in it. And I started reading it, and I got very excited because I saw a movie there. I saw a road picture. And uh, it, 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 it just excited me tremendously. But I said, David, I can't afford to write this on spec, so we've got to get some seed money here. And he was able to do it. He got someone who was able to pay me a little bit to write it and uh, uh, pay for the big lips to the And the story is basically uh, about these two young men. One is 34, David Foster Wallace, you know, uh, who, who will kill himself in 12 years. Uh, who is, to this day, uh, an iconic figure in American literature. Uh, and David Lipsky, who is a fine uh, uh, fiction and nonfiction writer, but was 30 years old and still very much up and coming and encountered uh, his idol. So you can begin to see that there are certain themes that I'm interested in uh, that, for me, converged when I was sent Lipsky's book. And when I read it, I became very exhilarated at how to put it all together. Uh, taking a 300-page transcript <coughs> and carving out a narrative, uh, using uh, interviews that I then conducted with Lipsky to fill in the blanks and to find the subtext. Uh, because there is no subtext in the, in, the, in the transcript, but finding the subtext gave me uh, an armature on which to build a story. Many of the, most of the words in this, I should say, are Wallace's and Lipsky's, but I, I hope I've done a subversive enough work of injecting my own uh, transitions and, uh, and conversations here so that you don't see where Marguerite begins and they end. How, how is writing, I mean, this is 101, but how is screenwriting different than playwriting? Well, um, screen, in the kind of playwriting that I do, uh, I, I aspire to a kind of seamless, Conversational style. It, it's naturalistic. I, you know, I have certain beats that I want to include, but I don't want you ever to see the stack of the two beats together. I want it to be as seamless as possible, so that when we arrive somewhere, we go, "How did we get there?" Much as it occurs in real conversation. In film, you don't have the same constraints of time that you do on stage, because in film, if you want to change the subject, you touch. You're, you're in the next week. You don't have to create the transition to the next week because film has been done that for you. So that, and film is also a much less tolerant medium. You really can't sit there for minutes on end. Although I am very proud of the fact that the end of the tour has 10 feet of scenes, uh, which is very unusual. You should hire your former Yale student to direct the shade class. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't have the same, uh, the same narrative and uh, having your former student as the director probably is an asset because I was going to ask you how faithful have they been to what you set out to do to the <coughs> director's meeting. <coughs> right? Yeah, well, uh, the director of the end of the tour is James Ponstall, who's uh, gotten a lot of attention in recent years because he directed a movie called Smash with uh, Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad. And then a year or two later, he had another hit at Sundance called The Spectacular Now, with Shane Woodley and Miles Teller and Kyle Chandler. And, uh, and James was my student when he was 19. And we kept in touch. And when I finished the Wallace screenplay, uh, I asked my producer if I could send it to him. And he responded to it overnight. And uh, uh, when I saw the rough cut of the movie last time, I was moved 
because what I saw on screen was what I wrote. And it's not the same as hearing my words. It was the movie I wrote. Do you know what I mean? There is really is a difference. Uh, because I saw dinner with friends translated to screen, and it, it wasn't exactly the movie I wrote. It's my words, but that's certainly not how I saw it. Talk, let's talk a little bit about the director playwright relationship in theater. Uh, mm -hmm. You've had the luxury, the pleasure of working with Good one direct, director a great deal of the time. Uh, what makes that relationship with Dan Sullivan so good? Uh, have you experienced situations that aren't so good with that outnaming names? And what, I what's even usual. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've already libeled on the Miller. We can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Not here. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sort of a serial monogamous when it comes to directors. Uh, because the, the, your, direct, your, your director's not always available. So I have to have a few directors on the show. Uh, and when I have a successful collaboration, I want to work with that director. What makes a successful collaboration? Uh, where I feel that what I'm doing is being served as opposed to being. Uh, the, as opposed to there being a lack of trust in what I'm handing over to the director, in which case the director feels that, that he has to impose his own vision on something that he spent a, a more of a, a rigorous time with, he could see a way into it. Uh, with somebody like Dan, with whom I've worked, I don't even know how many times, if you've done multiple iterations of such a production. Uh, but uh, we've been working together steadily since the 1990s. And uh, the thing about Dan, and I was talking to uh, the other day uh, in, in a discussion about the country festival, about the, the way I use over that, and the precision in the script of where the overlap occurred. Now that's something that uh, Mario, who did this to me, really was here to it beautifully and I'm very delighted about that. Dan is, is militant about this. If, if uh, an actor is overlapping in the wrong place, they'll say, no, 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 no. You've got to hear that word. <laughs> it's Dan. You've got to hear that word. You're coming in too soon and you're, we're not hearing it. God wants you to do it after that slash, you know, as your cue. So you know, the way of, and I'm using the, the notation thing as an example of how when you write a play, you're really providing a kind of sheet music for your conductor, your director. And with the musicality that exists in some writing, most writing, you want the director to conduct it uh, faithfully uh, without reinterpreting it, but, but to interpret it for the stage, but not reinterpreting it for his or her vision. So yes, Dan is, is militant about those, those kinds of moments. Uh, and I cherish that kind of fidelity. Uh, I seem to be quoting Bob Anderson continually in this session, but he used to say, these words are tested for sound. <laughs> uh, and, you know, what he was saying is, yes. you know, if you yes. change them at your peril, then he was right. Well, let's add the final ingredient to the whole mm -hmm. thing. Uh, critics. Um, uh, you want to read that? <laughs> No, um, a couple of things. First of all, is it fair to say uh, that you were not, in your earliest plays, greeted with tremendous enthusiasm? By that is her? correct. So, and um, <laughs> <laughs> not the only playwright who has succeeded who has had that experience. Um, how did that affect you, or did it affect you? Well, yeah, I mean, it obviously it affected did. your livelihood, but... Uh, yes, it did. Uh, well, yeah, but there's... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, let me say that I'm, I'm very delighted and feel privileged at the trajectory that my career has taken as a say, piece of independent standards. Uh, I really am. It's, it's really been quite a ride. I, you know, I think that nowadays, particularly in, in my experience of teaching young people and talented young people, there's far too much importance placed on early success. And I can speak from personal experience that some of the best minds in my generation who experienced early success have really struggled. And, uh, and we're not able to do the best work because they already were anointed. I struggled for recognition for a period of years. 
Um, I had the misfortune of having Frank Rich come to review a very early play of mine that he should not have seen. Uh, and then gave me a very disparaging, very uh, psychically damaging uh, review, uh, which kind of set the course for the next decade of my career, uh, in that when he reviewed um, uh, Gifted Children, which was kind of a, a prototypical play for collected stories, it turns out. I wrote Gifted Children. It was produced in 1983, my first full-length produced play in the world. Um, it, uh, because Frank Rich gave such a, a, such a disparaging review, uh, I, was, I was kind of shell-shocked for my next time up, which was when Joe Papp produced Sound of Tuna, six months later. And Joe, God bless him, really loved the play, loved Sound of Tuna, and was really a, a, a tremendous champion. Had great high hopes for the play and for me. And, and uh, we were given a gorgeous production. Claudia Wilde did a beautiful job. Uh, 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 it was just, it was a gorgeous experience. And then Frank Rich didn't like it. And uh, I, of course, it was quite disappointing because I thought it was going to you know, be that way. It wasn't. Then a few months after that, and mind you, my career was building at this point because I was getting the recognition in literary offices, at least. Uh, as, a, as a writer to watch and to be supported. I was invited into writers' units and all of that. That was happening along the way. But by 1985, my first production in Happy Theater Club was a play called What's Wrong With This Picture. And uh, this was all, mind you, within the space of about 14 months between Gifted Children and my third New York production of What's Wrong With This Picture. And uh, there were so many things going for that. Uh, the great Madeline Kahn was in it. Uh, it, and there were many things about it that were very good, but it wasn't working. And I knew it wasn't working. And I also had a, a, a strong, a strong sense of who I was and what my capacity was for yet another rejection. Because I thought it was certain that I would be, I would receive a brother and yet again. For something I thought wasn't there yet. It wasn't, it wasn't good enough. So if I was going to expose it to the world, knowing it wasn't good enough, and then get beaten up, well, I would have to be kind of suicidal. So I did something that young, unproven playwrights have rarely done, which is I exercised my prerogative and I called off the critics, which was a really controversial thing to do. Uh, it wasn't the most popular decision at Manhattan and Happy Theater Club, but I said, I, want, I don't want the critics, which meant that we played our subscription run to the Manhattan Theater Club audiences. And that the thing was over. And I, I feel to this day that if I had let that open, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, I don't think I could have recovered from yet another slap. I don't think I could have. I think that we would have gone to Los Angeles. I think I would have done very well in television, frankly. But that isn't the life I saw from my friends. So uh, I think I saved my career by not looking at that show. Have you ever learned anything from a career? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've learned about the importance of critics from critics. Uh, Did they have to tell you? <laughs> well, you know, we weren't going to do But, you know, critics are very disingenuous about the power. <coughs> Certainly, you know, whoever sits at the room uh, You know, the, the, when they say things like, the, you know, uh, critics don't close plays, producers do. Oh, that's not true. Uh, and critics certainly can make plays. Uh, so yes, I do recognize the, the, the inordinate power of one critic in America, whoever it is. Uh, and uh, I, you know, it's the reality. Yeah, it's, it, as we said yesterday, it's a really sad thing that not only can a critic in New York sink a play in New York, but it can have a tremendous effect on whether that play gets done elsewhere. And as we said yesterday, elsewhere is where theater is in this country, not well, necessarily in New York. That's right. You're, you're absolutely right. There's, if, if you don't get that, that validation in New York for play, regional theaters will not look at it. Uh, on the other hand, and this is, you know, now I'm being devil's advocate with us in our conversation, uh, 
about a year and a half ago, I had my, uh, my play The Model Apartment, which yeah. is very, has had a very checkered career. But it was revived by a young director in New York named Evan Hadnett, who did a lovely job with it. Uh, and I received the best reviews of my career for this very obscure play of mine. And a rave review in the New York Times did nothing to encourage people in the museum theaters to pick up this play. It had no production stuff. Zero. Well, as we said, uh, I hope that the way Country House was treated in New York doesn't make it harder to do it around the country because that's a play that deserves to be seen, as we all know. Uh, I think it's time now to open it up uh, to other questions that you might have, now that I've overstepped my bounds with David. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish. <laughs> and I said, 
Yes, he does. That's the story he tells. And for, you know, that, I, I look, it, what I am telling you didn't go much beyond that, but I mean, the scene out of it in, in Brooklyn War, obviously. But, you know, the ludicrousness of it uh, is, is so confounding that, yes, I did, I did write about it. You know, I, I, my experiences in Hollywood, I think, are very typical. Uh, I don't mean to suggest that I've been singled out or ghettoized in any way. I really don't uh, suggest that at all. Um, but, uh, but the experience that I, I'm uh, still basking in, this independent film being rendered so beautifully, is a, is a wonderful uh, place to find myself at this stage of the game. Yeah, thank you. Writing screenplays made me, uh, has made me a little more economical in my playwriting. And I don't mean just in terms of expense, I just mean in terms of economy of language and economy of, of uh, incident, possibly. Um, uh, I think being a playwright has influenced my screenwriting. Um, you know, I, my, my film scenes tend to have, have shape. You know, they're not just snippets, they're, they're, they're little events uh, that are strung together. And I, I think that that's part of my, my uh, training as a playwright. Thank you. You mean you tend to write film scenes with? Yes. Yeah. Which is not to say they're not uh, cinematic, but even you know, within a, a scene, I feel like I need a button. <laughs> you know, I need to land it somewhere. Do you feel, so, I, I was actually going to ask a similar question to it. Do you feel your plays have become any more cinematic as a result of writing films? I, you know, I, I... Do you feel more... I mean, I, you know, I've, I've seen and read a lot of your plays. Uh, have they always jumped around in time, always jumped around in location in as pretty a way as some of the more recent ones have? Have you always conceived this theater <coughs> as malleable as it... Well, I, I, I think Sight, Sight Unseen, which is a play that uh, uh, does jump around in time. Uh, That's uh, what I was thinking yeah. of, and that is a relatively recent play. 23 years ago. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it didn't occur at the beginning of the career. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think I was playing with the temporal quality of my plays so much. Uh, when I, uh, Sight Unseen began as a very different play called Heartbreaker, and what I was doing there consciously was a jumbled chronology. I just wanted to write scenes and then jumble them. But it was, it turned out to be very arbitrary and didn't, it was confusing without being crafty and I abandoned it. But then I, I simplified that idea and used the, the time elements very uh, judiciously in the between seconds. So, you know, <coughs> would you say <coughs> in a situation like that, the, the story, the circumstances dictate the form Absolutely. rather than the form yes. being imposed on the story. Absolutely. And that, that's something I, I, I continually would tell my students. You know, is it, oh, I want to write a plan where, you know, it's all, you know, everybody's, you know, whatever. And I said, well, what's, what, what's the story you're telling? Well, I don't know yet. Well, figure out what the story is you want to tell, and then you'll figure out how to tell it. But don't come up with a conceit and then try to put a story in your conceit because it's not going to work. And uh, you know, I think that just sort of those kinds of lessons I think are really valuable, and I think are things I've learned over the years. And I, I, I hope I'm saving people years of their time. Other yes, ma'am. We got a question from off of Twitter, uh, Ellen Ronnie. And she asks, what current playwrights do you admire? Okay. Uh, it's working. The Twitter is working. <laughs> uh, the, um, I, OK, well, let me just list them off the top of my head. Uh, Amy Herzog, uh, Annie Baker is, is astonishing. Uh, Stephen Cowan. Uh, Sam Hunter, uh, Brent 
Rick Rick is fabulous. Uh, there, there is a phenomenal explosion going on right now. So I, I'm feeling very optimistic. Um, more than I might have 10 years ago, but I, I do think that it is a, just a, a gust of talent. And you know, each year when I meet my students for the first time, and here we are in the very first century, and all these people looking at their talents all the time, and I say, why are you here? Why are you in a play like that? Slaves? And yet I'm, I'm always heartened by the enthusiasm and passion and the, this undying interest in what is supposed to be a dying profession. So, you know, I do have some hope. I absolutely do. Can you teach playwrights? No, but you can teach inspiration. You can teach, I mean, what I do in, in my syllabus is I share plays, as I said, that I love and I love talking about, and that I was exhilarated by when I was first trying to figure out how to do this. And if I can demonstrate to my students what is exciting about this, what stimulated me, then maybe they can begin to sort of uh, inure themselves to the possibilities. And what is the that's, best? That's, you can't really teach. And so, what is the best approach when, for you when a student comes to you with play? I mean, mm -hmm. how do you see yourself? I mean, I think the temptation of academics is always to write the play they want. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you see your function? I bring you my play, and mm -hmm. you see some talent in it. Mm -hmm. What do you see your function is in dealing with you if you want to? Right. Well, uh, you know, maybe to borrow from uh, a, a character like David and Luke Stoner, yes. uh, I I ask them questions. I ask questions. I don't uh, get to you know. I'll very often say, "What is the event of your play?" And they say, "I don't know." And well, you need an event. And then to describe what is an event. This is my favorite example of what an event is. And I may discuss this with some who are present here in a smaller venue here today. Um, uh, Canada Hops and Reed. Uh, when, when I ask, what is the event of Canada Hops and Reed? And somebody will say, it's Big Daddy's birthday. I go, well, no, that's an occasion. The event is it's Big Daddy's last birthday. And the fact that Big Daddy got this, that there's this diagnosis hovering over the proceedings, that information, and the fact that it's a last gathering, is what infuses that play with such high stakes that everyone on the play is, is ravenous. That's what makes it an exciting play. If it was simply his birthday party and they blew out the candles, we wouldn't be that play. So figure out what is the event, what is the climate that, that, is, that exists in which the play occurs? Yeah, one of, the, one of the things I like to say to students is, if a play is just about what it's about, it's not very good. Really. In other words, it's got to be about more than what it's about. And that is another way of saying what you're saying. Uh, you know, a long day's journey tonight is not just about a family's day. It's about a lot of other things. And plays that tend to not work, new plays, young plays, are often about. I, I once saw a play about a minor league basketball team in Ohio. But before I went to see it, I said to myself, this is a great occasion for kind of, well, it turned out to be about a minor league basketball team in Ohio. There was no residence in it. There was no other subject. And that's another way of saying what you're saying. It's, it's not the plot. It's not what happens. It's what's behind what it. What ignites that said. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. yeah. Curious question. <laughs> One play, one playwright for the rest of your life. Who is it? One play? One play, no. one playwright. I'm vicious. I, I guess I would have to I'd move to Grover's Corners. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my play. But then you get to come back to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was at a I was at a comparative drama conference a couple of weeks ago and the interviewer at the end of the interview asked Ten questions to which the person, uh, uh, David Lindsay Bear, was the player, and asked him ten questions to which he could only answer, you know, very briefly. And one of them was that, mm -hmm. and the other was, what was the first play you saw? Mm -hmm. Are you asking me that? Yeah, sure. 
The first play I saw, the first straight play, not musical, that I saw, was Burr Brothers, A Thousand Pounds. I knew that. <laughs> and uh, and that, that was a, truly a, a watershed moment in my, uh, my, the first nine years of my life. Uh, that, that came as part of the, the uh, what, what uh, in, in family lore became what we did all the time, which in fact we probably only did twice, which was to spend a week in New York and see nine shows. We would take the D train from Coney Island, from Chute Bay, to the stay at a cheap hotel in Midtown, and that's when a middle class family could afford to go to the theater. We, even if we sat on the last row of the balcony, we could get in to see something. That, that is not true anymore. There's no way to do it. But uh, Herb Gardner's A Thousand Pounds uh, uh, had a profound effect on me. It's not that I left the theater as a playwright. But I experienced live theater and laughter in the theater. They were so intoxicating to my little nine-year-old self. It stayed with me. And then, of course, um, cut to how many years later? Uh, 30 years later, my Broadway premiere, also my debacle, Herb Gardner sitting behind me <laughs> on opening night. And when the play was over, and it was not a good Herb's enormous hands grabbed my shoulder, and it was such a th thunderbolt of emotion. It really was. Uh, another one of the ten questions. Uh, I had them written down. Of course, I left the sheet back in the motel. Um, was if you had to write a play for a single actor or actress, mm. who would it be? Well, it is, it's so it's so obvious. That I, I would love to write something for Meryl Streep. She's she's. Bring her back to the theater. Well, that's, yeah. that, that would be one's goal. Um, another question was, and maybe you've already answered this, uh, what was the play you wished you'd written that you didn't? Oh, I see those every now and then. Um, I'm trying to think. I thought you were going to say I have, but that's too No, hard. no, no, I was, I was thinking more of contemporary. Yeah, right. Well, I can tell you, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is a screenplay. Uh, when I saw The Squid and the Whale by Noah Baumbach, I loved that movie. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had written The Squid and the Whale. And I wrote to Noah Baumbach, who well, I didn't know, but I said, I wish I'd written the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, you know, this doesn't happen to me when I'm walking but boy. And what moved me so much about Noah's movie was um, the family he depicted, this horribly dysfunctional family that he depicted living in Park Slope was the very family I always aspired to be a part of growing up in Coney Island. And so if it, but it, I, I really admire that script. I thought it was a terrific script. There's a question from the web. How long does it take you to write a play, including rewrites? Well, uh, you know, John Gray used to say, you know, it, it took him uh, 53 years to write Six Degrees of Separation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it really does vary. Uh, uh, by my friend and colleague Candice Chappelle sitting here, and Candice was present, literally present at the creation of Collected Story, when it was 15 pages, and eight days later I had Collected Story. And do you do do you use readings to help? You? I love readings. I I rely on readings. Uh, uh, my friends Michael and Jeffrey are sitting here, and we created a group many, many years ago, 37 years ago, called the Writer's Block in New York, where we read each other's work every Monday night for almost 11 years. And uh, that really was my graduate school education. Uh, learning how to hear the work, learning how to respond to the work, learning how to filter feedback that you get, and learning to be your own best critic, really. Uh, there's nothing like hearing it. I, I'm always telling young writers, uh, you, if you don't have such a group, you must create such a group. Because if you're going to be a playwright, it's not the same as being a fiction writer. Because fiction exists in one's head. Plays need actors. They need to be given voice. Otherwise, they're not plays yet. They're scripts. So until you can hear it, you don't really understand what you have. And what I've come to do over the years is I've become less precious about the, the what I have, so you know that experience I had uh, in, at Sundance with Candace present for collected stories. I will just hear whatever I have. 
Uh, when I was working on Time Stands Still, I had 40 pages. Uh, Gail Cates invited me to the deaf and to have a reading uh, of the 40 pages. And uh, they weren't even consecutive pages. They were just pages, like out of a notebook. And, um, and then I had another reading a few months later of the first act, and another reading after the first draft, and then another reading after the new draft. So it takes, it, t it can take years, is, is my long-winded way of responding to how long does it take. And do you but yes, I do use these. And do you use dramaturgs ever? I use dramaturgs, well, you know, uh, one of my uh, trusted friends and colleagues in, uh, is Jerry Patch, uh, who I met at South Coast Repertory many, many years ago. Uh, Jerry's a very valuable touchstone for me. So, yeah, I use eight on the <laughs> How much do the plays change, uh, let's say, from even in rehearsal or in, in later stages? Have you made extensive changes in plays? I, um, or any changes? I do. I certainly make changes. Uh, because I, I rely on the reading uh, aspect of development of my own work, most of my work is, structural work is done by day one of rehearsal, so that I'm not suddenly throwing new scenes at my actors. I don't, I tried doing that early on thinking that was what you did. And I, it made me very anxious. You know, my, my beloved colleague, Tony Kushner, thrives on that kind of uh, anxiety. I do not. I, it makes me very, very anxious. And um, uh, I like to have my ar armature set on day one of rehearsal. However, I will have a subsequent production, as I did with uh, Time Stands Still in the Country House, and, and Brooklyn Boy, too, where we began in California <coughs> before coming to New York. And um, with, uh, with Time Stands Still, uh, I cut scenes out by the time of that. I cut about 40 minutes out of that play between LA and New York. Um, the Country House, I rewrote the beginning of uh, of the, the second half of the play uh, in New York. But I didn't attempt to do it while playing in California. And um, have, have you ever, where did those, come, those changes come from? Are they suggested by a director? <coughs> Are they suggested by an actor? Or, yes, and or, yes. Or Lynn, or yes. <laughs> somebody yes. else? Yes. Yeah. Everybody? Yeah. Uh, yes, and you know, it's, it's you know, and I, look, I love actors. I love working with actors. And uh, just to give you a, a little anecdote of, um, uh, in, in The Country House, uh, Eric Lang played the role of Elliot. And we were interviewed in rehearsal. And uh, Eric uh, was, was confronted with his friend Michael, who he hadn't seen in a while. Michael was playing a mustache. He was getting a lot of shit for his mustache. And, uh, and Eric said, shouldn't I say something to him? I haven't seen him in years. I haven't seen this much. Shouldn't I say something? And I said, yeah, just improvise it. So in rehearsal, he said, where the fuck did this come from? <laughs> <laughs> and that became And I said, OK, into the text goes. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> yeah, that's just an example of what a successful collaboration should be like. Uh, have you ever, um, I've heard playwrights say this, so I'm asking with some background. Have you ever been surprised by a performance? In other words, seen a character you created done in a way differently from the way that you had envisioned it in the successful? Yeah, you know, uh, Lynn and I went to Paris to see Brooklyn Boy. And uh, it was a very different kind of production. It was, it was, it was very French. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of smoking and drinking. And, uh, and, uh, and it, uh, it was much more um, stylized. And uh, yes, granted, I don't speak French, but I certainly recognize my play. And, uh, and it, it worked really interestingly uh, to see that state. Um, I also had the experience of seeing Time Stand Still in Swedish in Stockholm while I was still working on it. And it was very illuminating to see it done in the foreign language because I was still, it was still coming together. And I actually put cuts in. Uh, for the production in Stockholm while I was in Stockholm. Because when you see your work in a foreign language, you realize, boy, she has been quiet an awfully long time. <laughs> and, uh, and you realize, know, yeah, something's imbalanced here. Even if you don't have the words, you're watching the behavior, and that was really important. Yeah, sometimes you can also feel that the scene has gone on too long yes. when you're not listening to the words. Yeah. And you just realize there's a duration sure. problem here. <laughs> Any other? Uh, Questions? What's our schedule, Karen? How are we Thanks. on time? Uh, we're, we're out of time. Actually. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Howl Round <coughs> And most importantly, thank
thank you to the Independence Public Library who sponsored this event and Julia Hildebrand. This library is a beautiful 